it's time for Coffee with the Chicken Ladies, a podcast for people who love chickens. Hey, everybody, and welcome. It's Chrissy and Holly from Coffee with the Chicken Ladies. We're here, and this is episode number 149 of our podcast, where we talk about everything chicken, family, fun, and more chickens. More chickens. We drink a ton of coffee. I'm talking a ton, but most importantly, we hug chickens every day. And we kiss them too. Don't forget, we brew coffee from a little coffee house in historic Gettysburg, PA, Bantam Coffee Roasters. Holly Ann, what kind of coffee are we brewing today? Today we're doing the classic Colombian coffee. It's Colombian. Where can everybody get Bantam Coffee? BantamRoasters.com. And follow them on social media. Are you ready to sip some of this absolutely delicious coffee and chat? I am. But first, a word from our sponsor. We have some exciting news to share from our sponsor, Grubly Farms. They're here, new and improved, Grubly's World Harvest. I'm a longtime subscriber, and my flock love the healthy, nutritious treats, plus orders $40 or more ship free. If you haven't heard, Grubly's has a fantastic layer pellet and crumble feed. It's packed with plant and insect protein, perfect for those picky chickens and ducks. Grubly Farms makes food and treats for healthy pets and planet. To support us in Grubly's, go to our website or our show notes and use the link. Try it today. Okay, so how are you doing today? Very well. Yourself? I'm good. We had some nice time. We've been working, and we actually took the time out to drink some coffee and sit and watch the chickens. We did. And really, by the time this airs, this will be over, but I'm having mouth surgery. Ah. I know, right? That's coming Friday, so... We've been packing a lot of work in a short amount of time. We've been really working, and I want your surgery to go completely smoothly because... Well, I hope so, because if I hear you saying that and it didn't go smoothly, I'm going to be like, you jinxed me. (laughs) (laughs) No, I didn't jinx. Knock on some wood. Knock on your head. (laughs) Oh, dude, I know you did not just say that. You did not just say that. Uh, Liar, liar, pants on fire. I always do this, though. I knock on my head. You're not wooden headed either. No. (laughs) We're a lot of things, but we're not wooden-headed. It's a joke. It's always like if there was no wood around, then you knock on your head. Got it. Yeah. I got it. Like, yeah. Well. Okay. So, yeah, you have that coming up. And so we've been packing a lot of work in. So we just sat outside and enjoyed a beautiful day. Mm -hmm. They're calling for really bad weather here this weekend. So we're like, let's take some time. And the chickens were hilarious. Oh, they were so much fun. Yeah. Especially one that starts with a G and ends with an E. Gertie. (laughs) She is fat and sassy. What a bad hen. I love she her so much. She came up to you with that Grubly's bag and pecked that bag. <laughs> like, excuse me, get me more. She meant it too. Oh, yeah. That's my girl. And then I went to record her doing it because it was so funny and she just walked away. She like, did. She just turned tail and left. She was like, nope, nope, no. You're not recording me now. Have you paid my fee? You're not profiting from my <laughs> hunger. No. And then she groomed herself for like 45 minutes after. She is the most spoiled chicken alive. She's crazy. So anything else going on except for the other Other, than the surgery? Not that I can think of at this moment. Yeah, you don't. That's one Um, of those things that doesn't get out of your head until it's done. It's feeling cozy. I'm going to be doing a lot more knitting. Oh, yeah. Sewing. So, 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 so. So, so, so. (laughs) (laughs) Sew those chickens faster. (laughs) While While you're laid up, you can make a few of the hens. Oh, by the way, we're probably going to be putting some hens on in a few days on the Etsy shop. Yeah, yeah, we have a so little stash. So keep a look out on social. But I am going to be knitting. I mean, I do get to do things that I like. You were supposed to knit us a snuggie, but you haven't done that I yet. need the time to spin the yarn for that, honey. <laughs> That's a lot of yarn. Okay, so on that note, if you're listening to our show and you're loving it, head on over to Apple Podcast and leave us a written review. It does amazing things for the growth of our show. While you're there, hit that subscribe button for two reasons. The first is you never, ever miss an episode. And the second, it's another really great, easy way to help the show grow. If you're looking for other ways to support the podcast, you can share your favorite episodes on social media. You can tell a few chicken-loving friends about the podcast. A few thousand. You can visit our Etsy shop, check out the t-shirts, the mugs, and hopefully the little chickens that we have for sale. You can become a patron of the show, patreon.com slash coffee with the chicken ladies. We have three levels of membership. An enormous thank you to all of our patrons, old and new. We love you. 
And the other thing you can do to help support the podcast is visit our website and our show notes, use our affiliate links and discount codes, and buy products from our sponsors. Yay! Hey, Chris. Yeah. Do you like subscription boxes? Does it have anything to do with chickens? Of course. Then yeah. Let me take a minute to tell you about the chicken love box. If you love goodies for your chickens and you, you need to go to chickenlove.com. I love the mega box. Tons of useful products for my flock and a chicken tea for me. You can't go wrong with a chicken tea. They are so cute and so soft. In the August box, I absolutely love those amazingly good smelling nest box herbs and that giant roll of rooster stickers. They're great. I love the wood decorative plate. It's going up in our studio today. And with all my baking, those egg separators are going to work awesomely. Boxes start at $39 a month. They ship immediately after your order and shipping is always free. Such a great deal. Don't wait. Get off the nest and click already. Use the code CWTCL50 for 50% off your first box of a three-month subscription or more. That's chickenlove.com. That's chickenluv.com. Get your subscription today. Have you heard of Strong Animals Chicken Essentials? They make natural supplements for your flock. Strong Animals has used plant-based products and natural approaches to promote the health and vitality of backyard flocks. Their products contain organic essential oils, prebiotics, and other natural ingredients to support the immune system and digestive health. Give your chicks and chickens what they need to thrive with Strong Animals health products. Visit GetStrongAnimals.com today. The Breed Spotlight is brought to you by Murray McMurray Hatchery, defining quality for generations. For over a century, Murray McMurray Hatchery has remained a trusted family-owned business working tirelessly to ensure our poultry meet the highest standards. Whether you are an experienced enthusiast or just embarking on the journey, look to McMurray Hatchery for guaranteed quality rare and heritage breeds, low minimums, and all the supplies you need to raise your flock. Request a free catalog today. Da, 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 da. It's time for the breed spotlight, yeah. Was that air fiddle? <laughs> It was. Air fi- well, I guess not fiddle. That was air violin. Yes. Air violin. Yes. Well, that lovely little serenade is for the Ancona. This week's Breed Spotlight is another Mediterranean chicken. An Italian chicken. To steal my heart. <laughs> <laughs> the Ancona is a really beautiful bird in the Mediterranean class. They are. They're like the leghorn, but fired up. Fire. Uh- <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure. I wasn't sure where to go with that. Well, they are. They are. You mean like this chicken's on fire? Yeah. In the best way possible. Not in the kitchen. (laughs) (laughs) The Ancona originated on the east coast of Italy, and they were named for the province of Ancona, or more specifically, the port city of Ancona. Mm -hmm. The breed is several hundred years old, but they've only been known in the US and the UK since the mid to late 1800s. You say only, but that's a long time. I suppose it is if you're just looking at near history. Right. It's not like BC right. or Right. Some of these like birds are like the, the dorking goes yes. back so far. Anyway, the Anconas are these gorgeous spangled or model birds. And you know how we love our Absolutely. Bird. And they're good layers. And honestly, they sh- they're another breed that should be more widely kept. I mean, they're a Mediterranean. Mediterraneans are known for their life. Right, right. So the Livestock Conservancy currently lists the Ancona in the watch category of the conservation priority list. Okay, I can deal with that. I I need them to go up higher, but I would have thought maybe a little lower. So it's possible that there are other, you don't see Anconas around here in the mid-Atlantic, or at least I haven't. But I feel like there could be other pockets of the country where they're very popular. I'm hoping for that. Maybe Mm -hmm. in the more, in the warmer climates. Maybe. Because, you know, they are warm weather birds. And of course, they're so beautiful. They are popular show birds. They're gorgeous. Yeah, they are. And Conus first arrived in England in 1851. A few decades later, in 1888, they were imported into the U.S. Okay. They were very popular with the English breeders who got to work right away to develop a standard. And the English also developed the rosecomb variety. Right. The Ancona did become moderately popular in the U.S. for a while, but they never really enjoyed the status of the leghorn. These chickens can't live up to the leghorn. The leghorn <laughs> is like, you know, the quintessential like chicken, you know, of the world. Well, they're kind almost. of amazing. They yeah. Are. So, I mean, it's really hard to live up to that. And I feel bad for them because they're like, 
man, we just want to live up to the leghorn. We're Mediterranean too. But hopefully with getting this breed spotlight out there, we can bring some a spotlight to this chicken and get them some more, get them some help. They're just beautiful. I keep saying that, but they're really beautiful chickens. The single comb Ancona was admitted into the American Poultry Association Standard of Perfection in 1898, and the rose comb was admitted in 1914. They were, of course, placed in the Mediterranean class. Of course. Of course. Now, the APA's Standard of Perfection notes that Ancona is likely related to the leghorn, though they do have several differences, but they think there may be some leghorn in their parentage. Their cousins. Yeah, it could be. Now, in the early 1900s, there were a lot of arguments over the origins of the Ancona. We're talking some serious breed snobbery here. Well, we know that exists. Yeah. Back in the late 1800s, some people didn't find a breed valuable if it didn't have a long and illustrious history. That's definitely being a breed snob. These people who were not proponents argued that the Ancona was a, quote, made breed, a crossbreed probably heavily derivative of the leghorn. What are they saying that it was crossed with? I have no idea. I didn't see that. <laughs> I didn't see that in anything that I read. I just thought the whole thing was ridiculous because even a new breed can have merit. Yeah, exactly. But I guess it's the whole thing of the heritage of it. It has well, to be long a long heritage. Well, how does it become long if you don't give it credit in the first place? There was nothing that they could find that said it wasn't an old bird. I think what was happening here is that there aren't that many written records, but there's a long community memory of the Ancona in this part of Italy. Okay. So it, they could have started off as a land race breed. I mean, there could be a thousand reasons. This could have been a bird of the common people, or it could have been a bird that was so ubiquitous, like the Java, right. that people just didn't it was in anything. every farm. Yeah, so they just didn't write anything special about it. It was just a worker bee bird that did their job, and they were like, okay, here's this bird. Mm -hmm. You know, that's the thing. It, it, it was speculation. Oh, well, because of this, it's a mixed breed hybrid, whatever. I mean, some of the letters that I was reading from these early poultry fanciers were just absurd. That's crazy. Uh-huh. That, I mean, it just goes to show you where the leghorn sits in history. Well, I was thinking to myself, as I was laughing about this, the 55 flowery hen is almost completely derivative of the leghorn, and I love that bird. Yeah. I think they're amazing little birds. I mean, it just shows my head keeps going back to the importance of the leghorn in the chicken world. Without the leghorn, well, so much doesn't exist. You know, the APA said that they're likely very closely related, but without genetic testing, there's nothing to show. Right. Or genetic testing could show that they have some relationship, but there's a whole lot of something else in there. And nobody was doing genetic testing in the 1800s at that point. No. So, I mean, it, no. it was all, you know, the town, oh, and you see this chicken or the lack thereof. I have a feeling that this bird is a lot like the Java, where it was just... So commonplace. Everyone kept them. They were just amazing birds that they never just they just never bothered they to write the about work them. On the farm, and that was it. Yeah, exactly. So, with that said, let's go into kind of what they look like. They're a small-bodied bird. They're about the same size as the leghorn, mm -hmm. which is a great size. They're small to medium, and they're they're great bird if you're in an urban area. Yeah, that kind of thing with. With size wise, the hens are going to weigh in at about four and a half pounds and the roos at about six. That's mm -hmm. right there in that small to medium category. Right, right. So that's good. So the anacondas, they have black body feathers with white spangles on the ends of the feathers. Mm -hmm. They're beautiful. They're gorgeous. As looking on the images, as I always do, I found one that had basically a bullseye kind of print. With the feather. Yeah. And it was so pretty. I think this is because the way the spangles show up on the feathers, it's like every fifth feather or as close as every third feather. Yeah. And it can just make this pattern with the way it's that one. the feathers flow. Yeah. They're so, so pretty. Mm -hmm. Now, they do have the bright yellow legs that I like. I know you like your yellow legs. I like chicken. my yellow legs. And I like some of them. They're modeled on the legs. Yeah, they can be. That's how the hoodans are. Right. I think it's so cute. It's, it's very another cute. way to tell them apart. Yeah. Now they have white ear lobes. Now, what's that going to tell you? And either the straight or the rose comb, mm -hmm. as we were talking about. Although, as I'm looking, I cannot, I think I just found it. I take that back. 
There's oh, the rose cone. That's the photo on the live second services and website. And that's the rose cone. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So as I was saying, I couldn't find one. I looked down and there it was. Wow, that guy's got a mighty set of waddles on him. <laughs> yeah, right? He's waddleicious. He is waddleicious. <laughs> I mm. mean, he is really. Mm-hmm. So <laughs> like you were saying, the white spangles are found on every third and up to fifth feather. So that's awesome. So the effect is really magnificent. Mm-hmm. I love these feathers. You know, we we both tend to like really black and white birds that have really graphic patterns. We are drawn to that. Like I could do a whole, I could be like Cruella de Vil farm and have nothing but black <laughs> and white chickens and I would be ecstatic. But we were talking about my one flock today, the older girl flock, the mm-hmm. old girl flock. Mm-hmm. And it's even the new babies going in. They're all black and white except for Margot and Bubbles, which are two buff Orpingtons. Got some buff in there. That's it. <laughs> Everybody else is black and white. So, I mean, there's something to be said for that spangled, mottled, black and white bird. They're just gorgeous. Just gorgeous. That is for sure. Apparently, there are a couple of non-APA standard varieties. I found both blue and red. Okay. Unusual. That is very unusual. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I think they're probably hard to get your hands on. They're probably only with a breeder also, so that's going to be tough. Right. Okay, so... Going next, we're going to look at their egg-laying ability. Now, first of all, they're Mediterranean, so we're hoping that... They're going to be champion layers. Of course. So, they are excellent layers Mm -hmm. of a very large white egg. And it's about five a week. That's in a really good category to me. Yeah. Lucy the Leghorn lays anywhere from five to seven a week. (laughs) Lucy's an overachiever. <laughs> <laughs> and the hens rarely go broody. Now, this is pretty across the board for most Mediterraneans. They don't like to be sitting on their eggs. I want an Ancona named Francesca. <laughs> well, I just have a the coaching named Francesca. I know, but we're at the point now where we're going to be using the same name sometimes. <laughs> well, you named one of the... You named one of the Houdans after my great-great-grandmother. I didn't know was that when we named her. It's a family name. Celeste. Well, she, well, she is your family. She's my family. <laughs> so anyway, I'm sorry. Back to back to the encounter. So if you want to hatch eggs with this chicken, it's really not going to happen. You're going to need an incubator. They're not going to sit on those eggs. Yeah, and hatch them where for I suppose you. another broody hen would work. Another a broody breed. Oh yeah, you bring a buff Orpington in there. Mm-hmm. They'll sit on those eggs for you. That's for sure. We did see that some people were irritated with their Ancona hen, that they were irritated that they took a long time to lay some eggs. To start laying, yeah. That's a heritage breed across the board. That is normal and healthy for a heritage breed. Honestly, I saw someone complaining that their hen didn't start laying until six months of age. And I was like, Gertie didn't start laying until nine. One, that's heritage breeds. Two, it's normal and healthy. And number three, every female body's different. Yeah, I feel like, too, once you have an established flock and you're adding to it, that is less important to you. Yeah. So as you are as you have adult hens already, the babies, you're just, they're just going to start laying when they do. It's well, not that it's not a big deal. It's just, that, it's just that you're already getting the eggs. But when you're anticipating the very first egg, I feel like you're really fixated on it. You know? And I don't know if some of these folks complaining, I don't know if they maybe are selling their eggs and they're looking for a, a high egg out- output, but they're just mad that they didn't. Most of the heritage breeds do not start before five months. Before six. Before six, should... I should say. Right, right. Six. I feel like six to nine is where you're going to get a heritage breed start yeah. laying. And here's the thing. They're going to lay longer in life for you. So... It evens itself out. Right. You know, so they'll start later and they'll go longer. Mm -hmm. But in the beginning, like I said, this is less of a big deal if you already have an existing flock. Right. And you're getting those eggs. Agreed. So you'll be like, oh, the baby's laid, but you're already getting eggs every day. But if it's your very first flock, that first egg is something big that you're waiting on. So that might be why you're like, oh, come on. We've heard from numerous sources that Anconas do well in mixed flocks. Yay. That's good. They're very chatty and talky chickens. Just up our alley, we yes. love chatty chickens. They can be a bit flighty when startled, like most of the Mediterraneans, but they will also bond with their caretakers. They can be quite friendly if they've gotten to know you. So could you see them with your Andalusians? Yeah, I could see them in there. Yeah. <laughs> yep. mm-hmm. I kind of feel like they would be like the Andalusians. Andalusians, Fayumis. How many chickens can a shade sail hold? That's what I would say. <laughs> You might find out. (laughs) The Anconas are very active. They're excellent foragers. They have good camouflage from those feathers. They do. But they still handle confinement relatively well. 
They are absolutely fantastic compost and garden cleanup helpers. Oh, you were applauding my chickens today for their gardening out there. They did an amazing job, but Rita was my favorite. Rita the Delaware was sending arcs of compost and dirt flying behind her. I love that. She was feeling good. She was. She was. She was. Those long legs. (laughs) And Kona's would make an excellent addition to a layer flock, a pet flock, or even as a homestead breed. And my new thing is to an urban flock. Yes. Agreed. And I'm going to make my own little urban category of smaller yet high achievers with egg laying. I think that's really helpful. Yeah. I really do. I mean, I think if you're you're a person that lives in a city or a townhome or something, Mm -hmm. you want to utilize your space the best that you can. Right. And there's a set of chickens, a lot of them are Mediterranean, Mm -hmm. that you can have that are high layers. The only thing is... They're going to need a little supervised free range. They have more energy and they will need more activity, but they take up less room in the coop and they do lay really well. Yeah. The Anconas are very heat hardy. They handle summer very well, but all reports say this bird does not like cold weather. They're Mediterranean. They will require shelter and almost definitely supplemental heat in cold climates. If you look them up, you're going to know why we're saying this. The comb and waddles are huge on this Mm -hmm, bird. mm -hmm. The bird is small, and the comb and waddles is almost double the size of the bird. (laughs) That's a slight exaggeration, but yes, we just slightly. Just slightly. The combs, especially the straight combs, are very susceptible to frostbite. I mean, even the hens with that cute little flop over comb, those bits of skin can freeze very easily. So, and the waddles, they're huge. Some waddle there, (laughs) man. (laughs) You waddle when you walk. You waddle when you walk. <laughs> That's a different waddle. <laughs> waddle. Oh, this is a pet peeve of mine. Waddle being misspelled. Oh, yeah. Waddle is spelled W-A-T-T-L-E, not W-A-D-D-L-E. That is what ducks do. Exactly. <laughs> Just a little pet peeve. Okay. So let's tell everybody where you can get the Ancona. Well, McMurray Hatchery carries an absolutely gorgeous line of Anconas. I mean, stunning. So can you see them in your flock? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Also, check the Livestock Conservancy Breeders Directory for breeders near you. Again, because this is a bird that we don't see locally. If you're looking for local breeders, it's worth checking with the Livestock Conservancy. Someone just found me today for Nankin eggs from the Livestock Conservancy. Nice. It had the farm's information on there instead of my farm, like the family farm. Oh. But she she tracked me down, so all good. So here's where I'm going to say my part. If you have the Ancona and you'd like to share a picture with us, share it on your stories and mention us. And then that way I can reshare it onto our stories. We want to see your chickens. It makes our day. We love to see them. Give us some beautiful black and white birds. Yes, we would love to see it. If you're looking for a chicken coop that's produced in a planet-friendly, sustainable way, try Nestera. Each coop is made from highly durable, 100% recycled plastic that keeps the equivalent of up to 2,000 shampoo bottles out of a landfill. Their clean, modern design will fit into any garden or run area and comes with an industry-beating 25-year warranty and a range of handy accessories. Simple to put together, so quick and easy to clean, and most importantly, red mite resistant. Your chickens will love it. Quick shipping from Nestera.us. For a 5% discount, use the affiliate link in our show notes, on our website, and on Instagram. Link in bio. Check them out today. Roosties proudly sponsors Coffee with the Chicken Ladies. We personally use Roosties products with our chickens and we're huge fans. They have their awesome nesting pads, do-it-yourself feeder and waterer kits, and they've just released their best product ever, a new chick feeder and waterer set. They have adjustable legs to keep food and water clean. They're super well made and the feeder even has a removable lid so it can easily be filled from the top. So if you're raising chicks or keeping chickens, all their products are available for prime delivery on Amazon.com. Check out the Roosty store on Amazon or follow the link in our show notes. Okay, so let's move on to main topic. Yeah. 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 This week's main topic, we're bringing you part two. Part two of our interview with Arthur Parkinson. We just love this interview. It was so much fun. It was so much fun. Arthur's just fantastic to talk to. Okay, so let's move on to another question that we have for you. We have and love your books, The Pottery Gardener, The Flower Yard, all about gardening. You know, they're liberally spiced with poultry. That's one of the things we really like about (laughs) them is the gardens and the poultry all in there. And what pushed you to write your newest book, Chicken Boy, with chickens as the main subject this time? 
Well, well, I always wanted to do a, a chicken book. The thing was, in a way, I'm glad. I, I'm glad it did come out when it did because my illustrations have become something I've got better at over time. I think it was. It just felt like the right time to do a memoir slash chicken keeping book, mainly because I didn't want to just write another how to keep chickens book. I knew it would have to be kind of about, you know, a bit more spicy than that. I lost my my nan Min at the end of the pandemic, so it was kind of a bit nostalgic for me to write a memoir now. And also, you know, when you're doing your own photography, you have to bank up quite a high level of of photos to then select. And I thought I'd just be able to find somebody, you know, I had a lovely friend, um, Sabina, who had a a fancying farm uh, called Feather and Egg at the time, and she'd got lots of different breeds. I thought, oh, I'll just go there for a day and I'll be able to get all the photos done. And it sadly doesn't work like that with chickens, because if they're not used to a camera, you have to spend about an hour waiting for them to relax. (laughs) You know, you take it for granted when you've got your own birds that are tame and they just become they're used to being photographed. That's when the illustrations really became a big thing, because I thought I'm not going to have time or the money actually to travel around the country finding, you know, people who've got a red cap or a Norfolk grey, or that's another sad thing about the book coming out now is in a way the UK, the, the amount of people keeping rare breeds in the UK, I think is probably at its lowest ebb, mainly because of the bird flu legislation, mm. which I think has been stronger than you've had it. You know, mm-hmm. our, I think a few shows have happened this summer with live birds, but not many. And I, it really has done, a lot of people have stopped it's particularly due to the price of, of feed as well. Oh, so I feel it's come out at a really good time to try and just get people to think, or oh, maybe rather than just buying, you know, ex battery birds or point to lay hybrids, maybe it will help make people aware that actually there's a huge variety of hens we can keep and, and conserve. So I'm hoping, you know, it, what's lovely about Instagram is I get messages all the time saying you've, you've encouraged us to get chickens and these are the breeds we're keeping now. So it's, it's a lovely thing to be doing now. I think it's very important. It's important as influencers in the chicken world that we kind of put a spotlight on rare breeds. And that's what we try to do also with the breed spotlight is put breeds out there that need some help and say, let's put a, you might not have ever heard of this chicken, but check it out. It's, it's a really cool chicken, mm-hmm. a little bit different than the hybrids. The heritage breeds are the way to go to keep the hybrids even going. So mm-hmm. You know, mm. we try to do the same thing, send the message out. Mm, definitely. Get those and rare breed birds. Of the rare breeds is just superior. I mean, you know, people are just obsessed almost like cut flowers and vase life. It's like, well, how many eggs can I get out of this chicken? It's like, that's not what it's about at all. It, okay, you might not get 300, 300 eggs out of this bird. You might get 200. Um, right. But, you know, that hen is going to live for much, much longer. And you're not going to have prolapses and you're not going to have, exactly. you know, brittle bones. It's... It's more of a almost like taking on a, a beautiful exotic parrot in a way. If you're choosing mm-hmm. to hamburgs or you know, you know, they're just so much. But to me, they're just proper chickens. There's just so many chickens in the world that are having a miserable time. Particularly if you're lucky enough to live somewhere where you don't have to worry about cockerels. You know, if you can keep cockerels and and keep a flock of heritage birds, definitely that's that's really proper conservation in in my mm-hmm. view. Absolutely. I mean, not to, I mean, we could talk about this all day, but not to mention the fact that if you look at global problems with disease and food supply, the heritage breeds have sometimes twice the amount of genetic material that the hybrids end up with. We talk about this all the time. And it's it's They're stronger sad. because those hybrids are the sweetest, sweetest chickens. They're bred to be that sweet, but it's so cruel that they only live two to four years mm. versus the four to eight to 10 that a heritage breed But it's because of the strength of the genetics that makes it so possible for them. You know, like some people, they're not aware. They don't know what birds are out there. So bringing awareness to these birds is number one so that people know what kind of chickens that they might want for their flock. Unless you're feeding a family of 15, how many eggs do you really need your hens to be laying? Four. I started out with four buff Orpingtons and And I still had way too many eggs, you know, 10 years ago. That's how I started Now I'm up to just about 30 chickens, but a family of four was fed off of four buff Orpingtons and I still had eggs to give away. I feed my entire extended family, my veterinarian and countless other people. I'm not telling you how many chickens I have because I'm superstitious and it's a lot of chickens. So (laughs) while we're being serious, we're just going to get your opinion on this. Mm. How important do you think chickens are to the world that we live in? 
I think in a way, to be honest, if someone said, and this is going to sound really controversial, if someone said, would you would you have chickens disappear? I would probably, for the sake of, of global welfare, say, okay, yeah, let's let's see them disappear. I know that sounds very weird, but because I know that about the billions of, of birds that are in complete misery and, and pain, mm-hmm. and there doesn't seem to be any slowing down on consumption, which I find quite alarming, actually, given that, you know, at our fingertips now we can see how chicken is produced and still there's a bit of slowing down, but there's no incentive really to slow down, is there, from governments or... So I, I think they they are important, but they it's almost becoming a time bomb of are they going to be the next pandemic due to intensive farming? Because we're mm. pushing, we're just pushing, pushing, pushing. I mean, I read all the time about bird flu and all the investigations and Kylobacter and food poisoning. It's grim out there <laughs> when you go beyond the farmyard. Do you have the same? So here in the U.S., we have this gigantic tidal wave of homesteading. And a Mm. lot of that does come down to people wanting to raise their own food. We don't Mm. do meat chickens. We respect that, but it's not what we do. Are you finding the same thing? Is that trend occurring in the U.K. as well? It it is. It is happening. The the problem is there's very little, and I know there's very little government support, your end too. There's no real... It's almost like, yeah, it's something you can do if you're privileged enough to afford it. But if mm-hmm. you're poor on a housing estate, you know, you really are stuck. The allotments aren't being provided and certainly not enough. There is hope. I mean, doing the book, I went to a lot of um, city farms, which I think are really important. And they're, mm-hmm. they're the places where this hard work is starting, getting kids to see the rare breeds, collecting eggs. And so it was it was very humbling, actually, to go to London and find city farms that had Derbyshire red caps and, and Swedish flower hens. And, you know, a lot of rare breeds were being kept there and they're getting the schools through. But food production and farming are still not part of the curriculum. It's still up to, you know, individual teachers and, and parents to to get those kids aware of where the food comes from. Right. Um, and, you know, it's as we know, it's it's expensive in a way to start keeping chickens you do need if you if you're not lucky enough to have a dad who's able to you know go out there and build a nice hen coop and you know exactly. you're you're looking at a, a large investment and of course you know a family of three kids they're going to look at me and go well, we're not pet we can't afford to keep our own chickens and there's a lot of um you know the first thing most people say to me is oh well so and so down the road had chickens and they ended up with rats and it all was a disaster there's a lot of miseducation still about keeping chickens Tons. yeah Tons yeah. out there. And you're right. It is. It does take a lot of money, first of all, to start a flock. It's not the price of the chicken, the bird itself. It's Um, the price of your setup. It's the price so that you have success and you don't lose them to a a predator or whatever. You know, starting that whole thing up is expensive. It does take that. Mm -hmm. And then the medical side of it, treating them for the medical ailments that they have, which they deserve treatment. It's another thing. You know, it does take take some money. You know, I see exactly what you're saying. Mm -hmm. In Baltimore City, there are groups out there that teach the children in in the city about farming and have the big, they have a farm where they teach them how to keep the chickens. Mm -hmm. I love that. We're in Maryland. So we're about an hour north of Washington, D.C. And we're, we grew up right outside of Baltimore City. Right. And there are a lot of urban farms springing up there. It's really wonderful work that some people are doing. And Baltimore City does allow chicken. Yeah, some some places don't, do do they? It's legislation. Folks here have to contend with is whether or not their municipality has laws against it. In the UK, though, you're dealing with, I don't remember if this has been passed or not, legislation where people have to register every single avian they own. Well, that, thankfully, that hasn't become law just yet. They have announced they are planning to... Originally, when the bird flu started, which was probably I'm getting on for 10 years ago, they started to encourage people with over 50 birds to register. And now, if you've got over 50, you are legally supposed to register. But they've just announced they're, they're considering getting everyone to register. The problem is, how do they do that? Because, you know, they've not got staff, deaf for the Department of Environmental exactly. Environment Affairs to, to patrol towns, urban. And it's all, I mean, what what is interesting, 
I think the UK probably allows a little bit more focus in on on farms when they uh, release the the hotspots for bird flu outbreaks. They are almost always the the intensive farms, mm-hmm. which are then like chickenpox spreading it to a few domestic individual keepers, but it's not wide scale. Um, there's also apparently yet to be a confirmed case of bird flu that has actually been spread by wild birds, because what people forget is a rat can spread bird flu from an intensive mm-hmm. farm, and a car can, and also a person can. Mm-hmm. So yeah. I- unless these farms are very tight on biosecurity, which you can see time and time again on investigations, they often aren't, you know, I think increasingly domestic keeping is being used to scapegoat what is an industry intensive farming problem. And I'm sure you you possibly may start to see that in America. But I know you'll find, you know, the nice thing about America is it's much bigger. <laughs> so that is a plus for you. Your bird shows haven't been cancelled, have they? I don't think. Whereas ours? Some have. I feel like they maybe cancelled in the first year, but then started bringing them back. Right. Yeah. The- the big show over here is the Ohio Nationals that's mm-hmm. held in November every year. And I think that went on last year. Yeah, that I think that's been gone at least the last two years yeah. they've held it. So and Yeah, I we have had our big year. main shows for nearly I don't think we've had our federational national show, which are both held in the winter time, prime prime birth for outbreak time. Right. I don't think they've been held now for it feels like it might even be four years. Wow. Yeah, and wow. they used to be, they were the biggest biggest shows, which everybody, you know, geared up for. Um, oh, and yeah. they, they haven't been held. Uh, people are moving into egg showing, which is exciting and nice to see. <laughs> really? Egg That's showing? Cool. Yeah, I mean, we, so. yeah. we do it at the state fair. You know, you take your prettiest dozen. Is it sort of the same thing? They're, they're, yeah, not a dozen. Normally it's, it's three perfect eggs on a little paper plate in sand, and they've all got to be absolutely uniformed. And I mean, the, the Well Summers and Moran's Club, they always used to do egg showing big time at the, okay. the big shows. But now I think because of the, the avian influenza, it's become a more encouraged thing. And what's nice is all the rare breeds and pure breeds, they're really grouping together on Facebook now. So, you know, I, just yesterday I was looking at, um, what are they called? Wolf Hampshire's or they a rare breed? And I couldn't find much about them, but I found them on Facebook and they've got a little club. So all these really rare breeds, okay. you often find it's a lovely club on Facebook, um, which yeah. is nice. Oh, definitely. Yeah, Facebook is a great source for chicken keepers. I mean, having rainbow eggs, everybody wants to show them off. I have both a Well Summer and Moran's and they have special places. Those eggs are beautiful. Definitely for sure. The leg bars, even the beautiful blue eggs from the leg bars. I think that's a good thing. Show- and then they, great. you should do like show off egg and then a recipe with it that you made with your eggs. Why you got to push this further? <laughs> that's what I do. I push everything one step further. I'm like, I just like a recipe on there. Oh my goodness. Well, we're going to circle back to your book yeah. a little bit. So let's go into your book. Mm. What is your favorite part of Chicken Boy? In in some respects, I know people have all said, you know, we love the memoir bits and I wish they could have been bigger. I think my favorite bits are the bits that I read and think, yeah, that's really helpful for someone who maybe hasn't kept chickens before. It's little things like just saying, look, don't put the chickens out in the hen run when you get them home, put them in the hen house, give them some time, peace and quiet. It's all the little bugberry things that I see a lot, either on television programs or Instagram, you know, where the chickens are lifted out the box, chucked in the middle of the garden. It's like, oh, I've got new chickens. So uh, I hope the bits of the book that are useful and people can digest and just the bits that I feel hopefully give people confidence to understand what chickens are rather. And that's what I wanted the book to be, really, an understanding Mm -hmm. of, of the chicken and how to think like a chicken a little bit rather than just this is how to keep chickens A, B, C, D. Yeah. I think that's important. I think that's wonderful. I feel like, I don't know about the UK, but here I think some folks get chickens and they fall into this mindset that the chicken is essentially a machine. Right. Yeah. They don't stop and, and understand. So it really is a beautiful thing that you were able to include that. It just goes back to that emotional connection we get from them and they get from us and understanding it and understanding mm-hmm. that there's so much more than an egg machine. <laughs> and, yeah. you know, they, they bring us such joy just sitting with them and watching them on our laps and you know, we really do hog our chickens every day. And it's just the way it is. <laughs> I mean, we do. They bring us such joy. They are wonderful. They really, they're just, 
I just love the energy they have, to be honest. They never, unless they, when they're poorly, they never, have, they've just got a lust for life as soon as you let them out, don't they? Yes, they really do. So we love the idea of a chicken garden. Mm. In this area of the country where we are, we're hampered a little bit. We essentially end up building gigantic runs that are like an aviary because we have coyote, we have eagles. Yeah. So are there any flowers and herbs that you would recommend growing for a chicken-friendly garden? I think um, the sh- the shrub root is is the thing to do. You know, anything woody and and a firm firm stem. To, um, I mean, to be honest, over here with with the avian influenza, with the lockdown, you know, keeping chickens under cover. Do you have fruit cages over there? You know, we do. We don't call them fruit cages, but we have yeah. them. So to, what I've been saying to a lot of people is, you know, just see your chicken run as a fruit cage, really, and plant lots of gooseberries and currants and raspberries. All things that are quite, you know, resistant to scratching because these plants have got woody stems and they're quite tall. And the lovely thing is, of course, when they do fruit, the chickens have got something there to jump up and and peck. And, you know, another thing, people don't realise chickens really love cover and and vegetation around them and overhead, just like their ancestors do. So the more shrubs you can, you know, surround your coop with or have within the coop, the happier those hens will be. Um, you know, they love a bit of sunshine, but they do love dappled shade as well, don't they? Oh, yeah. it's so important that shade to have them safe from that mm-hmm. harsh sun that comes down. It's yeah. one of the things it's always there should always be some shade in that mm-hmm. run. OK, so I'm going to move on to the next question. Are there any interesting projects coming up in the future? A new gardening book, chicken stuff? Yeah, um, yeah. well, I've, I've just done. I've had a meeting literally last week with a card company. We're going to start doing my drawings on on greetings cards, which is really exciting, and gift wrap too. Um, so that's, I'm really excited about that, about, you know, again, celebrating the rare breeds. And, you know, for me, when I'm doing my illustration, I really I really hope people look at my drawings and think, yeah, that's a good example of a, a buff or pinton or a coaching. For me, if, if that's what I'm doing, then I'm doing a, a good job of that. Because I, I get annoyed, actually, when I do see poultry and chicken you know ceramics and things and they're wrongly labeled or you know that it's it's a, it's a bugbear that only a chicken breeder would have but you know i don't want to see a a buff coaching when it's clearly a buff orpington it's got to be right you know, we are 100 yeah. percent with you of course <laughs> <laughs> you know you get a lot of tea towels and you think no that's not a, a light sussex it's not half black it should just have a little black collar and just things like that <laughs> so uh, yeah I'm, I'm excited to try and and do more more drawings of them and get get it onto product and because I think things like that are often also what what can kickstart someone to go into chicken fancying you know your illustrations are charming you did a um I've been keeping Swedish flowers for a long time and you did a Swedish flower illustration that I absolutely love they're very hard to do because they're mm-hmm. so different. It's like, mm-hmm. you know, you Google them and even on, on Green, Green Fire Farms. How do you stop yourselves from just going on that website and ordering more and more from them? Because, of course, over here, we can't order Dale chicks to be delivered in the post. It's um, very difficult. It's, you've got to chain your hands <laughs> down so I, I, that you yeah. don't go on your computer. <laughs> Honestly, the answer to this is all of our runs are full. And so yeah. that is that's sort of what stops us. It is very difficult to have the self-control there. Also... A lot of theirs are straight run. Yeah. And in Chrissy's case, she doesn't keep cockerels. And my husband and I, we have a bachelor flock and we we take in rescue roosters a lot. We have a lot. A lot of I bet you do. Yeah. We do some conservation breeding with the Nankin bantams. Yeah, I heard you you do you love those, don't you? Oh yeah, yeah they're I, I've had a a few people don't like it because I'm very honest about what I do with my male chicks. Mm-hmm. Um, I do. I do call them. We don't have issue with people calling for table birds. We don't. I mean, our whole thing is, if you're going to have them, if you're going oh. to have all these males, don't dump them. You know, yeah. don't throw them at the fox. Right. And then you might go on on pre loved or you know, I think it's free cycle. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And the amount of adverts, and I get very annoyed actually. I think this isn't responsible. And then you might see some poor cockerels in a rabbit hutch, and I just think no. Mm-hmm. You know, if you're not going, if you're not prepared to do one thing or the other, um, right. exactly. Right. So, um, my my husband's latest rescue. I know you'll appreciate this because you like the breed. My husband's latest rescue is a little Duclay rooster. Oh, lovely! <laughs> He's cute as a button. 
Um, no. He doesn't retic- He doesn't particularly like me. He was running around an apartment complex. Someone dumped him. In the state above us. Oh, and Holly and her husband went at night to climb with headlights no, on and Pete, everything. That was Pete. That was not and me. climbed and took him out of a tree. Oh, and took him home. And now he, he really is my husband's darling. That is one spoiled, that, spoiled cockerel. That's the one thing that, I mean, there's a lot of things. But the one thing that really makes me upset is the dumping of the roosters. Yeah. I, I mean, to act like yeah. their life means absolutely nothing Mm -hmm. then we talk about it and we don't know if you've heard it but we call it the rooster plan you have to have a rooster plan before you start getting into chickens and we always joke that my rooster plan is yeah holly yes (laughs) you know so it's it's like you have to have a plan of what you're going to do a one thing that got became very popular especially during the covid shutdowns was hatching so everyone got little incubators and everyone was hatching but we had to say look if you're hatching you have more than a 50 percent chance yep that you're going to have yeah. a cockerel and you need to know ahead of time. And- well, just seeing them as disposable, isn't right. it? Yeah. It's just, I mean, it, I, I can't imagine doing that. Yeah. Um, yeah it's all- horrible. And it's just a disregard for the cockerel. And, you know, having that plan beforehand is just so important. It's really, it's a necessity. It's the only thing you can do if you're going to be responsible. And having a table bird, that could be your plan. Absolutely. That's a responsible plan. Leaving an animal to die from starvation or from predator attacks is not a plan. No. You know, so that's some of the stuff that frustrates us. It's I like hatching with, with my broodies. I, I like to have chicks the old fashioned way. I can't remember the last time I used an incubator, to be honest, but yeah. And I, I hate to see when people have hatched the chicks. They're just in little hamster cages and they're nearly five weeks old and you're like, they need to be on some grass, get them on bloody grass on some sunshine. Yeah. You know, just in and just on newspaper. It's it's just awful. Oh, uh, the newspaper drives me crazy. So we <laughs> clearly see eye to eye with you. I was that little boy and I document this in the book. I would go to the library and I would get out chicken books and that you know, that was how mm-hmm. I learned to read. I mean, I've got a pile of them here. Poultry for anyone, Victoria Roberts. That's still my Bible. Nice. Such a gorgeous book. Are and there black coachins on the cover? Orpingtons. Um, or, or, or bees. Or bees. And this, you know, that was my Bible. Um, and also Katie Fear, who is, isn't is mentioned much, but she wrote loads of really good chicken books. Okay. Books. So, yeah, I mean, that was me as a little boy reading and now you've got YouTube, you've got lovely podcasts like this, you've got Instagram. There's kind of no excuse anymore, I don't think. For, Agreed. For just... Well, let's go to a fun question. Yeah. <laughs> what? And I, you're allowed to have more than one because there's no way we can answer this. This is the question one. we ask everyone. What is your absolute favorite breed of chicken? <laughs> um, but buff coachings probably are the one that I really love. I also love, we call them, I like Cotswold leg bars. They're kind of a form of the cream leg bars, um, but they're just a little bit more colourful. Um, I love them. I love the crests and I love I love the fact, to be honest, that they don't go broody all the time. Um, mm-hmm. This is, is, can be very annoying when you, you don't want to be hatching every five minutes. <laughs> yes, yeah. it really can. Most definitely. Do, do there, but yeah. <laughs> I have another question. Mm. In the Pottery Gardener, yes. you you had ducks at the Emma Bridgewater yeah. factory. Yeah, and I was duck crazy. So I'm <laughs> I'm just curious how what was the experience like and are you ever going to get more? Well, it was the perfect garden to have ducks in because it was mostly raised beds and the floor of the garden was it was an old building yard, the garden. So the floor was concrete with gravel. And there was a, a drain in a corner of the garden. So I bought a lovely old galvanized tin bath. And so two times a day, tip the bath out into the drain, lovely clean water, very lovely little, you know, it was just a piece of fence and a ladder. And I, I, you know, I got a hen to hatch. I think they were miniature crested apple yards. That was it. And they were Aww. the most gorgeous, gorgeous, you know, it was perfect. Three, three eggs out of six hatched. Two were ducks, one was a drake. Um, oh. And they, they were just the most gorgeous little ducks to have poddling about. And would I have them again? I think so. I think I'd like water somewhere with proper water on the property. Mm-hmm. Uh, I th- it is it is lovely to have that free-flowing water. But, yeah, I, I do like ducks. I love Cayugas. I also had them at Bridgewater Pottery. Um, and they went to live with a friend who's on Instagram, Cotswold Country Bird Jack. 
who's an amazing poultry woman, and she keeps her ducks so spotless. She's got them in this big concrete yard. They've got straw, lovely beds, and yeah, they've their duck bath. It look, literally looks like a bath you would get in yourself and wash in. It's like the uh, misconception. Everybody thinks they're so messy all the time, but well, they just, like, don't clean them. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and if if they're not if they're not free range, they get messy. They they they're a free range gorgeous thing to have if you can have a. Right. A fox free, free property, no coyotes, raccoons. They're wonderful, aren't they? But confined, they just they don't cope very well confined, bless them. Right. Um, right. But you see, you know, I grew up reading Beatrix Potter, Jemima Puddle Duck. So of course I always wanted ducks and um I do love giving a you know a peek in Bantam some little duck eggs. It's a lovely thing to do. Nice, <laughs> nice. Yeah. Um, I think my husband and I, we need to build another and it needs to be very large, aviary. Yeah. So there's yeah. a spot in the front of our property where the duck run is going to go. And we have some espaliered apple trees uh-huh. and some and, and an herb garden there. And we sort of want to extend it so they can wander through there. Mm-hmm. It's going to take some work, though, because, I mean, we have giant red shouldered hawks and yeah. just predators everywhere. We don't have the, the birds of prey issue too much here, um, but I know you you guys really do. It's bad. You, you're lucky yeah. you're so lucky We're i mean i i do love avery i love avery coops i'm about to buy several they're called stretch penthouses from the domestic fowl trust which have solid underlying roofs nice. um, and I don't like them because i don't like my hens in the winter to be under the rain and the snow right. uh, but yeah i mean if if it was america they'd have to be in something like that all the time because I've seen video, you know, Instagram things come up, these hawk attack videos. Um, they awful. look very awful. Yeah. It is. You have Jersey Giants in the UK, don't you? They're very rare. I've only seen them once. And I'm sorry to say the problem with me drawing chickens, the black breeds, I find very hard because you yeah. just don't mm-hmm. the big black blob. Right. Um, yeah. So right. I'm, I'm very guilty. I mean, I don't mention, and also crowed, crowed langtions, they're also black. Mm-hmm. Um, and Australorps, none of they uh, sadly aren't mentioned in Chicken Boy, but I'm t- really trying for my next illustrated book to to find a way of of drawing these black breeds so they don't just look like big, you know, round circles. It's got to be tough. Um, I guess the Langshans easier yeah. because they're they not so green fluffy. Sheen, right? Yeah, and they I have, have a, a green yeah. sheen to their feathers. Yeah, if you can get that color. a little bit. Um, yeah. But, yeah. I mean the the copper black morans are hard enough. At least they've got a bit of you know lovely rusty That's orange. That's sort of rough. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. but, yeah. Your Spitzhaben illustration is by far my favorite. <laughs> I absolutely I like, love, I love that. Them. Um, they're they're kind of like drawing a Corella de Vil Dalmatian. Yeah, um, right. <laughs> we always say they need to be the cover of like a rock album. Yeah. Like they need to be like put on the cover. <laughs> you guys I are perfect the for that. They're punky. They're great. Beautiful breed. So Arthur, where can people find you? I know you're on Instagram and I know I've seen a lot of Claudia on your Instagram. I'm that beautiful yeah, blue. Yeah. yeah. She's she's it, it's so interesting the personalities. You get lucky now and again getting the ones that are very happy to go to, you know, talks and events and she's just one of those and and Linda, my cream leg bar who sadly I lost in the fox attack, she was also the same. They just aren't phased by people and you can take them anywhere. Um, so yeah, she's she's always about, thankfully. <laughs> so are you on Instagram just under Arthur Parkinson? Yeah, just Arthur Parkinson. I am on Facebook, but that doesn't get as much attention. But I'm trying to make you know I'm more an effort to go on and post more. But yeah, Instagram I kind of treat as as like my website. So any news is normally posted on that. So that's the best way, really. To see yeah. all your drawings and everything off. Yeah, I have to, I mean, it is an addiction, but it's a helpful one because it's just so lovely that you're, you know, so accessible to everybody throughout the world. Like, look how we were talking today. Wouldn't happen if Instagram wasn't there. Right, so, it's true. It's true. Yeah. I will have links to Chicken Boy and the Flower Yard and the Pottery Gardener in our show notes. U.S. audience, you can buy them straight on Amazon. Arthur, thank you so much. This has been an awesome hour talking chickens with you. And it's so nice to see someone who cares so much for the chicken to draw them, to write about them. I love it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, ladies. And likewise, you're doing amazing work. Thank you so much. Thank you. you. We'll talk to you soon. Bye. Bye.
We just want to thank Arthur one more time for spending a really delightful hour with us for talking chickens. Remember to check out Arthur's books. They are linked in our show notes. You can buy them on Amazon. You can follow Arthur on Instagram. Yes. Thank you, Arthur. It was so much fun talking with him. Okay. So let's move on to cracking the eggs. Cracking those eggs. Now, we came up with a multi-purpose recipe here because this is one that once we were brainstorming, we were like, ooh, you can use this for breakfast or a nice appetizer. We definitely like this as appetizers. I like this for a happy hour in the backyard with your chicken bar glasses, with the chickens walking around. Aren't you fancy schmancy? I love it. I think I would love this. So this week's crack in the eggs is breakfast egg rolls or appetizer egg rolls. Egg rolls with egg in it. Mm-hmm. Hmm. We base this recipe on deep frying these because that's how they're traditionally made. Yeah. But they're very easy to make in an air fryer if you have one. It's a new way. And we call ours the Ella Fryer. The Ella that's fryer. how she does all her cooking. Yeah, she really likes the air fryer. You can also bake them, which is much healthier, but they don't have the same taste and crunch. I use gluten-free rice paper wrappers because I can't have the traditional right. egg roll wrappers. And I just pan fry mine. Yeah. And they turn out pretty well. But if you're looking for that deep crunch and that taste, you do want to deep fry them. It's completely up to you. And it's if you're doing it for a happy hour, you mm -hmm. may want to go ahead and deep fry them because that's a special occasion. Right. As an appetizer, if you're just eating a bit of it here and there, not a big deal. Right. I would like these with champagne, please. <laughs> Be so good. Or Prosecco. I mean, we can, we can oh, yeah. stay with the Italian theme with our Anconas. Well, that's all we drink. Prosecco. Oh, yes, it is. <laughs> okay, so let's go into the ingredients that you're going to need for your appetizer slash breakfast egg rolls. It's going to take five large eggs, a tablespoon of half and half or dairy-free half and half or oat milk, a half teaspoon of salt, a quarter teaspoon of pepper, a quarter teaspoon of paprika, one cup of shredded cheddar cheese or dairy-free cheese, a quarter cup of red bell pepper, finely diced, a quarter cup of finely diced onion, a splash of olive oil, 15 egg roll wrappers or gluten-free rice paper wrappers and water for brushing. And then you need the vegetable oil for frying or however you're going to do it. Right. If you're going to deep fry, right. If you're going to deep fry, you're going to put about three inches into whatever pan you're frying into like i always I said, make sure i have a very i have a really large one and i do it and i pour the oil in yeah high sides exactly yeah. because you, it's gonna spray and, spit and you also can buy the big cover that mm -hmm. goes over top yeah so it doesn't get everywhere the fry cover, yeah it's like a splatter cover i've made my own what did i make i made something for ella and i just kind of put it in there and made sure it didn't mm -hmm. but i very very rarely fry very rarely it's been years since i've deep fried anything yeah and that's fine with me you're going to start by making your filling. You're going to use that generous splash of olive oil in a large skillet over medium heat. Add your onions and peppers and cook, stirring occasionally until they're softened and just starting to brown. You're going to whisk together the eggs, the half and half, the salt, pepper, and paprika. You're going to add all of that to the skillet with the veggies. And you're going to cook it, stirring through the eggs the way you would normally scramble eggs, you know, mm -hmm. stirring through with your spatula. At the last minute, add the cheese and stir to combine. Leave the eggs creamy. You don't want to cook them very dry because they're going to go into the wrappers and cook again. You know, if you're going to make this for happy hour appetizer, add some shrimp too. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That would be really good with the egg. You could do a splash of hoisin sauce. Yeah, or Old Bay. Yeah, you could do that. So I would go for the hoisin. Bay. There's so much you could do with this. This is another creative recipe also. You can make it your own. Absolutely. Change out the veggies. You can do all kinds of things. If you're deep frying, this is where you want to start heating that three inches of oil to the shimmery stage. Yes. You're going to fill and roll your egg rolls. So if you're using the rice paper wrappers, you need to soften them in warm water for three minutes or so before you use them. One wrapper at a time. You're going to lay each wrapper down individually. You're going to spoon about two tablespoons of the egg mixture into the center of the wrapper. Fold over each end. Roll it. Tuck in and seal the long end using a bit of the water. Or... Honestly, if we're being honest, fold it your way because we are not good at this step. We are not good <laughs> folders. In the interest of full disclosure, we're not good folders. The other thing you could add in here, and I'm sorry to go back, but it's like you could add... You're just some, sitting there thinking about it. <laughs> like, what else could you add in here? Is cabbage. A little bit of cabbage with your egg. Well, when I wrote this recipe, I almost put the cabbage in there, but I was like, that's too labor intensive. But well, it would be amazing. You could have your bunnies prepare it for you in the garden. 
Stop. <laughs> Those bunnies. Like you could pay them, like I'll give you a little bit of cabbage, but work it for me so I can put it in my egg roll. I planted Tongho chrysanthemums, <laughs> which have this really, really delicious green. Every single seedling is gone. <laughs> Every single seedling. Anyway, I don't know why I laugh. But I don't know. We digress. Because you like to watch my frustration. <laughs> so now you're going to cook your egg rolls. So once they've all been rolled, you're either going to put them in the deep fryer, you're going to pan fry them. Or the Ella fryer. Or the Ella fryer. Or the oven. And if you bake them, let us know how that turns out. Because again... We do it the other way. Yeah. Yeah. So... Once they've cooked, whatever your chosen way is, you're going to remove them, put them on a paper towel lined plate. Yes. And let them cool a tiny bit. If you're using these as appetizers, you're going to cut them into small pieces on the diagonal. Right. If you're eating them for breakfast, try them with salsa. Yeah. Also, they're good with duck sauce. Love duck sauce. I didn't even think about duck sauce. Yeah, that would be good. I love it with them. You need cabbage if you're doing the duck sauce. Get that bunny working out. No, I'm sorry. You should have... Why didn't you remind me of the cabbage when I was writing this recipe? <laughs> anyway, like we said, you can really customize this one, and it's delicious. Okay, try it. You might like it. And it's a good way to use your eggs in a different way, and mm-hmm. it's a good way to impress your friends at a happy hour. Okay. So if they make it that long. <laughs> they won't. You'll eat them before <laughs> so they get out there. eat them in the kitchen. Okay, so let's move on to retail therapy. Retail, retail therapy. therapy. Yeah. Yeah. This week's retail therapy, it's kind of a do-it-yourself therapy. Mm -hmm. And we see this a lot. We see a lot of people talking about pallets. They make the flag with the pallets. They do different home projects. When you said make the flag with the pallet, you mean they paint the American flag on a pallet, like country style. I'm sorry, my brain just... I might have said like, it wrong. But, I don't know. But no, I don't think you did. They do some really, you could do some really cool stuff with oh, the palette. Yeah, yeah. You see people make headboards with the palette. Yep. I mean, really cool stuff, tables, everything. So we were thinking, what can you do for chicken projects with a palette? Yeah, you can end up with a lot of these if you have things shipped to you. Like we've had fencing supplies shipped to us and we ended up with a bunch of pallets. You can also. Pick them up for free sometimes from local businesses. A lot of times. Or on a neighborhood group, you might see people are getting rid of them. This is my absolute favorite thing to do with pallets. It's a low-cost DIY for winter. Putting down some pallets in your run for the winter at any time, but we're thinking about winter right now, is a great way to give your birds a way to get up out of the mud or snow. My absolute favorite is to put some rubber mats over the top of the pallets. It gives a really cleanable surface. You can squirt it off. Exactly. What happens is everybody knows that the ground freezes. Right. So the wood doesn't. Right, right. So it gives them a place to be off the actual frozen ground. It's much easier on chicken feet. And that's why I like the rubber matting, too, because it right. gives them some more grip. Exactly. Yeah. It's. A, I feel like it's a much better solution than throwing hay down or straw. Yes, <laughs> given the experience we've had with that. Yes, exactly. And I think if you use black rubber, it absorbs some heat. Yeah. So that might be even nicer for them in the wintertime. Exactly. So that's my contribution. I love it. Just put the pallet in there, put the rubber mat over top if you can. Now, if you want to work, really do different stuff. If you look online, you can find lots of things to do. I mean, people are even making coops out of it. It's something that if it interests you, look at it, there may be a plan for you. So they disassemble the pallet and they rebuild with the wood. Right. The one that's my favorite is basically you're going to use the pallet and turn it into an herb garden for your chickens. Those are cute. Like it's like vertical gardening. Exactly. And you can put it, but you have to make sure that you're securing this to your fencing or to whatever so it doesn't fall over onto a chicken. And it gives them a place where they can eat the herbs nicely right in their run. You can also make a weather shelter. You make a you make like a teepee out of it. Yeah, where you fasten two of them together. And it makes a windbreak. Uh-huh, like and a you, triangle. Yeah, and it, you can put their food in water so that when it's snowing and it's raining, they have a place to go. You can put multiple together to make it as big as you want. And the other thing that we saw a lot of is making a roost. A place mm-hmm. to make vertical playgrounds. Yeah, yeah. This, you have to be really careful with these, that they're secure, that they can't fall. Right. But they're just really cool, different projects to do. I even saw someone making fencing 
It's a low fence, but you can certainly make fencing. Well, with you it. could you could stack them and make them That's higher, true. but you still gonna have to use some hardware cloth just to kind of seal up all the holes. Right. But it's just how we can reuse and recycle. You can actually make double decker if you buy yourself a couple of two by fours and cut them in certain lengths. You can kind of make double decker pallet table. Oh yeah. So like you said, that gives you more vertical use of space. It exactly. gives birds a place to get out of weather. It gives birds a place to get up and roost. And or shelter uh -huh. from wind. It's a great wind block. And you know, like you said, it gets them off the ground. We can do a little herb garden. There's so many things we can do with it. You could. If you go, what I just said, if you did the double decker with the two by fours, you could put plywood on one or two or even three sides and make another outdoor shelter for them. Yeah. Almost like a run-in shed for chickens. Or you could combine the TP idea, right? And on the outside, plant the herbs. You could. Yeah. So it acts as both. A little garden shelter. Mm -hmm. That would be really cool. How long would those herbs last? Not long. Not long. I mean, long. you're going to be replanting herbs a lot. <laughs> Make sure you get the seed packets. At that point. <laughs> right. So, yeah, this is just something that we were looking at and we thought it would be kind of interesting to talk about because... We like to recycle and reuse, and they're just cool ideas. Absolutely. So if you have any additional, message us or email us. Or if you've done some projects, send us the pictures or share them in your story, and we want to put those up on our storyboard, too. Yeah, we'd love to see your ideas. Okay, so should we tell everybody what we're going to be talking about next week? Next week, we are spotlighting the absolutely beautiful Old English pheasant fowl. Oh, they're so pretty. Main topic, we're talking cold weather prep. It's going to get cold. It's that time of year. <laughs> what do you do? I go for cracking eggs and make pumpkin donuts. They're so good. And retail therapy, we are reviewing Grubly's new vitamin and probiotic packs. Our chickens are going to be great on them. Mm-hmm. Okay, so what should we tell everybody to do until next week? Hug your chickens. Every day and kiss them too. We'll talk to you next week. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. If you'd like to see more of us, please follow us on Instagram at Coffee with the Chicken Ladies. If you'd like to help us grow the podcast, please leave us a written review on Apple Podcasts. If you'd like to become a patron of the show, please visit our Patreon page, patreon.com slash coffee with the chicken ladies. Thanks for listening.